All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to our latest installment of uh, Let's Talk Leadership by the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, Inc. As you all know that have been tuning into these sessions, uh, these sessions are designed to talk to some of the thought leaders that are part of our organization and others that are uh, a part of our sphere of influence and our sphere of friends to uh, discuss their journey of leadership. Uh, with the primary goal being to help our scholars that are embarking on their own journey of leadership along the way and just hear how to do things like deal with difficult conversations, what are different principles on leadership, and uh, just pour into our high school students, college students, and young professionals that are uh, becoming leaders in their careers. And so today we have a, a, an amazing treat for you. Uh, we have Mr. Keith Parker with us today. And uh, Keith is a First and foremost, a dear friend, uh, but he is an amazing leader in our community. So I will introduce Keith and then we will jump into our discussion. Um, so Keith, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and Keith Parker is the president and chief executive officer of Goodwill of North Georgia, one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the Southeast. Goodwill of North Georgia spans a 45 county territory operating 64 stores, 54 attended donation centers, and 13 career centers. So it is a massive operation. They employ 3,000 team members and annually Goodwill of North Georgia serves more than 7 million shoppers. Through the revenue generated in its stores, the organization is able to train and connect over 25,000 North Georgians to jobs each year, establishing Goodwill of North Georgia as one of the most successful workforce development agencies in Georgia. And many people don't realize that your dollars that you spend in those stores are actually used to get people jobs and employed and that the organization is a nonprofit that is focused on workforce development. So thank you for that work as well, Keith. Parker took the helm of Goodwill North Georgia in October of 2017. Prior to transitioning into his leadership at Goodwill of North Georgia, Parker served as CEO of the largest transit systems in several cities, including San Antonio, Charlotte, and most recently Atlanta when he ran MARTA. Parker's five-year leadership of MARTA won widespread acclaim, helped to transform one of the most beleaguered transit agencies in the nation with budget deficits and public image issues to a fiscally sound award-winning organization and establish MARTA as an important player in Georgia's economic development efforts. Throughout his career, Parker has received numerous awards and accolades as a transformational leader, transportation visionary. I mean, he's won the Texas CEO of the Year Award in 2011 and 2012 the Georgia CEO of the Year Award in 2013. He was recognized as the nation's most outstanding public transit manager by American Public Transit Association in 2015. Um, one of the most, 20 most influential people of the decade. In 2016, Parker was appointed by the President of the United States, Barack Obama, to serve on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. In November the same year, he was named one of eight public officials of the year by Governor Magazine. In 2017, Parker was selected as one of Atlanta's most admired CEOs by the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Georgia Trend Magazine has recognized Parker as one of Georgia's 100 most influential leaders on multiple occasions. And in 2019 and 2020, Parker was selected as one of the city's most powerful leaders by Atlanta Magazine. So we truly are with a transformational leader here today that has been recognized as such. His commitment to one of his alma maters, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, has been notable. He received the VCU Alumni Star Award in 2015, followed by an appointment to the VCU Board of Visitors by Governor Eric Olive in 2016. And most recently, Parker was unanimously, unanimously selected rector and chairman of the VCU Board of Visitors. So he does a lot to give back to uh, educational institutions as well. Parker and his wife are natives of Virginia and have three children. Parker holds an MBA from the University of Richmond as well as a Master of Urban and Regional Planning and a BA in Political Science from Virginia Commonwealth University. And he is a 2014 graduate of Leadership Atlanta 
They aren't quite as good as our 2019 class, but we'll put them right up there with us. <laughs> so um, again, Keith, thank you for being here today. I know you're a busy man and uh, thank you for pouring into our organization and investing in our young people. And I guess we can, let's talk leadership. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. You know, whenever I get introduced like that, I'm always looking back and thinking, man, what are they gonna say uh, at my funeral? So what, what, what's gonna be the next thing from where I am now to that final day, what do I wanna get accomplished? So that's, that's, a, that's a script that I'm still writing. Hey man, with all of your accomplishments, you're gonna have that Aretha Franklin funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that is definitely a compliment, man. You've done it all. So we know you had extensive experience in the transportation space, and now you're in the nonprofit retail space. Tell us about your current professional position and the road to getting here. Sort of, what's your story? You know, a lot of intentional things and other things that just sort of happened. You know, that as a as a young guy, I was in. Petersburg, Virginia, you know, in, in, um, in high school. And my first just thrust in the leadership was this group called Gentlemen Athletes and Scholars, the Gas Guys. You know, we were sort of a dressed up hall monitor group. And, and that gave me my first little touch of leadership in a school that really was recognized as one of the worst in the state of Virginia. And you never know, you know, where your blessing might be coming from. But uh, that, that school, Petersburg High School, also produced people like Blair Underwood, the actor, uh, Moses Malone, the basketball player, the singer, Trey Songs. But it literally barely made accreditation year after year after year and had all sorts of uh, struggles. But because you were in the midst of, I'd say turmoil, strife and so forth, the guys who made it through really made it through. And so there was a toughening about you. And, and I took that, that, that mentality that I could sort of handle anything to college where I took on a lot of other leadership opportunities and then decided at a very early age, I wanted to lead and I want to lead at a young age. I wanted to be a CEO by the time I was 30. That, that was one of my goals and, and took that on, uh, jumping into the, the world of public transportation almost by accident. The, the thing was a, a friend of mine who was working for the Greater Richmond Transit Company in Richmond, Virginia. She had an internship, introduced me to someone, did that. Within two years, I went from intern to vice president of the uh, organization. And then about three years later, I got that first CEO position. So I was able to do it right at around 30 years old and uh, became the CEO of the Transit Authority out in Washington State with, uh, with this opportunity, I had this little uh, fork in the road moment. Take a job that was close by, in, in fact, here in Georgia, could have become deputy CEO of a transit system here in Georgia, or move 3,000 miles away uh, and take on a position where African-American population in that city was one half of 1%. Wow. They never had a leader uh, outside of really their general area and so forth. But that what started this pattern that I've tried to uh, stretch it. You know, if there's, if you got two choices, take the harder one. Uh, the one that's going to stretch you and so forth a bit more. And then was, you know, found some success in every city. So I've been able to run transit systems uh, in five different cities, uh, leading them to better results, making a little bit better place than it was when I got there. And then ultimately arrived here in Atlanta and MARTA was the ultimate challenge in <laughs> public transit because at the time it was viewed as the worst job in the industry uh, for mm -hmm. CEOs that not only did it have record-breaking budget deficits, had lost 25 million riders over the past few years, had raised fares more than any other transit system in the country three years in a row. So you had the budget problem, you had the fare problem, you got ridership problem. But then the fundamental thing that all of you all know about uh, public transit here in Georgia, and it was a lot of people didn't even think it was necessary. You know, there are lots of folks who just thought, give the poor people a couple of bus passes and that's it, you know, this, this other transit stuff, irrelevant. But we were able to turn a lot of that around pretty quickly. You know, when I, when I came in, my first day on the job was with uh, the CFO. And he mentioned to me, Keith, you know, we're losing all this ridership. KPMG had done a study saying that the agency would be fiscally bankrupt, that it was going to lose $33 million my first year, be fiscally bankrupt by uh, the year 2017. 
and that uh, by the year 2015, I'm sorry, and that the uh, ridership will continue to go down, so forth, so on and so forth. And by the way, I'm resigning uh, in, by the end of this year. That, that, that's what he uh, mentioned to me. But by the time I left, we actually had uh, turned around the ridership issue, turned around the image issue, and I left them with a quarter of a billion dollars uh, in the bank versus them being bankrupt. And so when I started looking at what was going to be next, I knew I wanted to try something impactful uh, while I was still young, healthy, and so forth. And looking around at what was plaguing Atlanta more than anything else, and to me it was income inequality and the lack of mobility if you're born poor in this city and in this region. So what group could help change that more than any other? And I thought Goodwill of North Georgia could because Goodwill actually is the number one agency in the state in helping people find jobs. That uh, we helped more than 27,000 people in the year 2020 find positions. And we're the number one nonprofit in the country of helping African-Americans find jobs. So we helped more African-Americans find positions than any other nonprofit in the United States of America last year. So that to me was a very logical next step of moving from being impactful on a whole community to being more impactful on groups who are more disenfranchised, disadvantaged, having more barriers in front of them. So that's how I arrived at where I am now. So what was it like going from transportation to this nonprofit workforce development space? You spent several years in transportation and developed sort of a set of skills there. What was it like transitioning to a whole different industry? A bit daunting. Mm -hmm. Right, because I looked around and there just weren't very many uh, folks who looked like me and who came from my background. But the but the thing is, leadership is leadership. And, you know, there are certain fundamentals that if you get your team right and you come up with a good plan and you have a supportive board, I think you can pretty much accomplish anything. And that's the way I took on uh, the, the Goodwill assignment was to jump right in, try to be an extraordinarily uh a detailed listener, uh, not somebody who's going to come in and just blow up the shop and say, hey, look, I, I, I'm here to save you, but a very accomplished and uh, detailed listener, along with someone who's not afraid to uh, approach things with a different and uh, innovative mindset. So you mentioned becoming a CEO at the age of 30 and then having a very distinguished career in transportation and then moving over to the nonprofit workforce development space, retail space with Goodwill of North Georgia. What role did mentors play in that journey of helping you become a CEO by around the age of 30 and then helping you sort of develop in transportation and then helping you with that transition? It is just watching people do it, you know, and, and, and lots of different people at all levels of organizations uh, not just leaders, but but seeing how people skillfully do various things. I've watched you in action uh, and seeing how some of the things I uh, have been impressed with by you is how you use your humor to introduce yourself to folks and then can take on very rough, tough topics because you have now built down, you've now knocked down that initial wall that people might have. So I've watched you in the way you lead. I've watched Dorch in the way he leads. I've watched Keisha Bottoms, I watched Kasim. Uh, these are just people here right in Atlanta and a whole host of other folks and see the way they do things. I don't necessarily call them mentors, but I call them as folks who I can learn from. And then you watch people who bombed and done a whole host of things wrong and know, all right, I see the path they went in and I don't want to follow it just that same way. And then be humble enough to also learn from your own, those mistakes and those things that, uh, may, that, may, that may fall. You know, this, this whole thing, this whole notion of being a, a good leader, I always think it begins with being a good listener and watcher. Uh, that if you do those two pieces, you'll pick up a ton more and uh, than just simply resting on your own accolades and all those pieces, but looking, seeking uh, ways of doing things better, more innovatively from a whole variety of people. So to all of those mentees out there that are listening, that's great advice of how you sort of get the most out of your mentoring relationship is listening and um, sort of being open. And what other, what other tips would you give to get the most out of a mentoring relationship? 
Oh, and, and that is definitely push your mentor. And if you're a mentor, push your mentee. Uh, that, that, you know, make them uncomfortable. So if your mentor, you know, uh, if your mentor doesn't like to talk about certain things with you and so forth, but you need that, let them know that, hey, look, man, I know you don't like talking about your family, but I'm trying to be a good family person. Can you spend just a few minutes with me about how you talk to your daughter or how you talk uh, to your brother or your, you know, or, or your mom, uh, all, all those things that I might be struggling with as a mentee that I need, you're saying that that's off limits, but brother, that's what I need you for uh, right now. Make, make them uncomfortable. Same thing for the mentors. But if you know there are certain places that your mentee needs some help, but you're sort of, sort of waiting to the right moment, the right moment may never come. And that person will much more appreciate you bringing up a difficult topic with them than telling them later, hey, look, I wish I would have talked to you about it. So you know, make, make each other feel a bit uncomfortable, but then the final piece, respect each other a great deal. Respect each other's time, respect each other's commitment. So if you two have agreed, this is how we're going to meet, here's how we're going to uh, conduct ourselves in those meetings, honor that. Uh, you know, Nobody wants to waste their time. Nobody wants to feel as though they're just there because they had to check off a box. Uh, of a responsibility. So yeah, be, be engaged when you're with each other and hold each other accountable as well. So at Goodwill of North Georgia, Goodwill Industries of North Georgia, there's the retail component, then there's the service and workforce development component. What does the what does your day-to-day -day look like? Or what, what how would you describe a day in your life at, at Goodwill Industries of North Georgia? Yeah, we, we've got three very distinct businesses. You've got the big retail side that everybody knows about. That's about that. Whenever I ask people, uh, when I give speeches, I'll say, how many folks have either donated to or shopped at a Goodwill? Almost 100% of the room almost always raise their hand. So people are very aware with that, of that. But then we also have the, as you mentioned, the workforce development component, where we provide job training, job education, and actually help people actually find the job itself. Uh, connecting people to places like Home Depot, Amazon, uh, Coke, all these different industries. We help them actually find the jobs after we go through the career training with them. But then another lesser known piece of our business is what we call our facility services business, where we provide cleaning, logistical, other services for groups like the CDC, the Jimmy Carter Center, and several other federal buildings, primarily with people with disabilities. Most of the folks who work for us in that realm 90% of them have at least one disability, most have more. And so when you go into the Jimmy Carter Center, that building is being completely taken care of by Goodwill employees who, again, mostly have disabilities uh, and, and are there to turn their lives around. Many of them came to work with us with barriers and so forth. So you got these three very distinct businesses, retail, uh, workforce development, and then facility services. And mastering all three of those can be a real challenge uh, because the retail end, for example, last year really struggled in the year 2019. Thankfully, we were able to uh, turn that around and became profitable and very solid uh, by the end of the year, while our workforce development had a record-breaking year. I mean, we've never helped more people before find jobs and so forth. And then facility services also had a very strong year uh, with when, when COVID hit, for example, um, we became in more demand than ever before because the CDC is a 24 hour, basically international business at this point. And we're the ones who are providing the logistical work as well as the cleaning services and, and disinfecting the whole area and all those types of things. So yeah, very different businesses, but all critical to Atlanta's overall economy. So um, as a leader, I wanted to talk a little bit about the retail side of the business sort of in this pandemic environment, which we know has dealt a blow to society as a whole. What are the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome on that retail side and how did you navigate them? Well, even before COVID, remember what was happening in the retail business, that Amazon is effectively eating everybody's lunch, uh, that Amazon was causing business after business to go out of business. So some of the very places that, hey, we all grew up with, Toys R Us, Sears, JC Penney's, those places were going out of business or really struggling before COVID hit. And so we were seeing a retrenchment, if you will, of the retail space in never, uh, in never before 
uh, levels, never before seen levels. So then when you add COVID on top of that, what that ended up creating was those businesses who were already struggling, just really, they succumbed. And those businesses that were sort of in the middle, it depended on leadership. And then those businesses were already thriving. They seemed to thrive even more. The Amazons and those who were able to pivot to the e-commerce economy. Uh, we were sort of in the middle, but now have become stronger as a result that we now do a ton more on e-commerce, for example. So that was something we started soon after I got here. And now it's being a growing piece of our business sector. We also know that people don't like going to shop as often as they used to. So we used to have a lot of folks who come in to a Goodwill store and buy one thing and they're gone. Those types of shoppers are not there anymore. People now come in less frequently, but they buy more when they're there. So we try to make sure we have the shelves fully stocked and the stores are very clean and it's very inviting and so forth. So that part of the business we had to pivot on. The other side uh, happens to be with on the career services. People who are looking for jobs don't like to come into facilities as much as they used to. So we've dramatically ramped up our virtual career services. It's called careerconnector.org. So you can go to career, careerconnector.org and go through the entire job connection piece that we offer, almost all of it virtually now. We actually train you virtually. We will connect you with a counselor virtually, review your resume, give you interview skills, all of those things. You don't even have to leave your living room. That work has exploded in terms mm -hmm. of the number of people who are using it. So we've had to revamp the business because the demand is different now than what it was before. On that retail side, so, so what steps have you taken to make your location safe and instill confidence in your team members and all the people that shop in your stores and utilize your services that it's a, it, it's a, safe, it's a safe place to be? Well, we took a very bold move early on when COVID hit of requiring people to wear a mask. We were one of the very first businesses to do that. Uh, and some folks did not like that decision. <laughs> I'll just say that, to say it mildly. Uh, we got literally thousands of Facebook posts of how dare you, how dare you, how dare you, this is America, this is, you know, all the things you hear. Um, uh, but I'm glad we did it because it set in motion a culture of safety. So in addition to that, We've now made donate, donating a contactless uh, enterprise for the customer. So rather than you get out of your car and hand things to our uh, attendants, instead we tell you just put whatever you're donating in your trunk or in the back of your SUV. And then when you pull up, we take care of everything from there. We take the item directly out of your trunk for you, put your receipt in there, and, uh, and you never have to come in contact with, with, our, with our employees and vice versa, because we don't want our employees to get sick from customers and we don't want our customers to potentially get sick from, from our employees. In addition, we brought a whole slew of new technology to disinfect the stores and disinfect all the materials that are coming in and so forth. And as a result, we've had an extraordinarily positive safety record up to this point. And you want to, you know, knocking on wood that that continues, but we've had great success having had to shut down any store, any facility, anything like that because of any significant outbreak of COVID, unlike many other retailers who've had to go through that. As the leader and the person that's going to receive that incoming fire when you mandated the mask in your stores, how did you manage that? Like, how did you get people to buy in and manage that? Well, that's tough. It is. And we had a lot of deliberation discussing it because we're in the business of trying to sell things. So we don't want to turn away customers. And, 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 you know, and plus, we didn't want to be in the middle of a political firestorm either. And as you recall, as that, and it's still not so. I mean, there's still some people who think asking them to wear a mask is a, an infringement on their rights uh, as an American. But when we weighed all of it and discussed and deliberated, uh, what's the right thing to do? We just decided, hey, look, man, if we're going to get criticized, let's get, let's get criticized for trying to keep people safe mm -hmm. versus getting criticized for being a little bit too uh, loose with, with other safety. So that's what we did. And, and, and again, we got all sorts of threats about, hey, look, I'll never shop there again. I'll never donate. I'll never do this, never do that. But what we've found is we've had record-breaking levels of donations. We've had record-breaking levels of shopping. So we think we did the right thing. 
but it, but it wasn't easy. I don't want to make that sound like, hey, just one day I woke up and said, this is what we're going to do. No, it was much deliberation, much discussion, and then decided, let's, let's, let's go in this direction. But, you know, it sounds like, you know, as a fellow leader, when, when you have the right North Star, and it sounds like in that decision, your North Star was keeping your customers and keeping your team members safe. Everything will work out when you have the right North Star. I, I would tend to agree with that. And if it doesn't work out, you can feel good about how you got there, though. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think the decisions we most regret are those decisions where we sort of went the wrong, we, we were going with the wrong motives and then things don't work out. That's when you feel doubly bad about it. I mean, there, there I made plenty of mistakes in, in my time and choices that I wish had uh, materialized in a different way, uh, but I felt good about why I made the decision. Those you can sleep with. You know, the, the ones that you have a much tougher time is when you, you're going for the wrong, you're going in it with the wrong motive and the outcome turned out bad as well. Those are much tougher. You mentioned that um, the, the retrenchment in the retail sector was an issue before COVID. Have you experienced any other sort of obstacles that are outside of COVID that you had to deal with? Oh, just as I mentioned with Amazon and people moving to e-commerce more and more every day, Folks uh, simply uh, thinking, hey, look, I can go to a one stop, I can go to a mall and, and, and be able to, to uh, take care of all my shopping needs. Goodwill is a separate trip. You know, we're, we're not inside malls, we're not inside shopping centers and so forth. We, we require you to t make the conscious decision, I'm going to Goodwill. So we have to continue to give people reason to come to us. And, and, we, have to, and we like to think the biggest reason they're coming is value that they, there's this one of a kind shopping experience when you go into a Goodwill because it's never the same uh, from one day to the next. We want the customer service to be the same, we want the cleanliness to be the same, the product changes every single day. And we wanna make sure that people know that and that, uh, and that when they come to us, it's a unique shopping experience that's worth that extra trip. So the additional piece that we have to constantly be cognizant of is who the competitors are. A few years ago, there was a stigma of wearing use clothing or purchasing a uh, piece of stemware that somebody else had. Now it's almost a badge of honor. So we have all these competitors coming into the, you know, coming into our universe, the real reels of the world, the thread ups and all those folks who didn't exist five years ago are now, you know, trying to take pieces of our market share. So we've got to be aggressive and innovative and in how we battle all those folks. So it's a great thing that people now feel comfortable with wearing a suit that somebody else once wore. Mm -hmm. But knowing that there are all these new players in the marketplace means we got to up our game and be at the top of it in order to survive and thrive. Um, I mention this all the time. It, 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 I, I truly believe that leadership is the willingness to fail publicly, right? It's risky because when you're the leader, you're going to catch all that incoming fire and, and you're a serial leader and landed in one of the toughest sectors in business right now, which is retail. So what motivates you to deal with the daily grind of being a leader? Well, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that listening is, is one of those key aspects of being an effective leader, listening and observing. Uh, the other piece is being humble, that if you get into this stuff and you're too wired, that you're too vain, or just have too much chutzpah that you can't be humble and, and learn from your mistakes, you're gonna struggle because we, because our approach has been, if you're going to fail, fail quickly and move on to the next thing. You know, that, that uh, try something, doesn't work out, accept it, learn from it, move on. But I've seen far too many leaders who have gone out there and basically say, you know, this is my way, here's how we're gonna get it done. And when you do that, you create uh, adversaries, you create acrimony, and, and it makes it tougher to move on and learn from that mistake. But then, just as important, people who may have been able to guide you away from making that mistake won't speak up because you're not accepting, collaborative enough, collaborative enough open enough to bring in, you call it the incoming fire, there's also incoming uh, support that could be there for you. But if you carry yourself in such a way this uh, 
again, this arrogant type of, I know, don't need to hear from you manner that can make life much, much tougher for you. The other part about being able to uh, fail uh, publicly, as I think as you described it, it humanizes you. It makes people root for you. You know, uh, we've seen some politicians who are very, very skilled, uh, but because of some personality pieces, uh, struggle because people won't even bring to them suggestions or ideas. We've seen business leaders who have those same sorts of traits that, man, I, you know, I had this idea, but and I'm afraid to even bring something like that to you, baby, because I'm sure you've already thought of it. And what I tell my team and others all the time, the worst idea is the idea you didn't present to me until after the fact. You know, that's the worst idea, worst advice is like, oh yeah, I thought of that, but thought you already knew. Let me tell you I already knew. Uh, that, that's a that's an easy conversation to have. <laughs> the much more difficult one is, oh look, yeah, I knew that A plus B was going to garner C for us, but I didn't bring it to you because I thought you already knew that. And, and, and that is the worst advice or worst information is the information that's now uh, obsolete that you already had. So presenting yourself as a humble person, presenting yourself as somebody who wants to listen, who wants uh, others to bring to them ideas constantly. And as you said, being able to fall, uh, fail publicly is great. Uh, that I, I want people to know that I feel very comfortable about being wrong and, and them challenging me. There's no ego that's going to say, I'm going to blast that person and try to win every argument. No, I'm going to encourage debate uh, and, and lots of good back and forth because that makes me uh, more, uh, more solid as a leader. It makes the organization more solid in terms of the decisions we're making. So you have some leaders that have a laser-like focus on sort of the bottom line, or you have some leaders that really focus on process, or some leaders that really focus on people um, or some leaders that are just disruptors, like that's just what they do. What is sort of your North Star as a leader? What is, what is your focus as a leader? Um, when, when, when you show up and, and, and now they're handing the keys to you, what, what, what is your North Star? All the above, but situation that every one of those things that you've got, at least I've had to be those things at, at some point or another. Sometimes I'm just uh, a big cheerleader who can go out and talk more, talk better and more effectively about goodwill than anybody else can. Sometimes I am that hone in on the bottom line and let's count every paper clip and discuss why there's a variance on your, on your monthly report that went over the one and a half percent threshold. Uh, like, let, let's spend time on that. Sometimes I'm the employee advocate who uh, goes into HR and says, hey, look, I see a trend here that's disturbing uh, to me. And sometimes I'm the disruptor who walks through the room and says, all right, we've done it like this and it's been somewhat successful. Let's start all over and do it very different. Let's try completely different this, this time and let's go for it. And, and, uh, and, and again, I think the most effective leaders are those who are comfortable taking all those various roles when they need them. But in terms of the things that never change, I always tell people, stay ethical, because trying to remember the things you lied about or, or cheated on, very, very difficult. So to stay ethical, if you do that, uh, that, that makes your life a whole lot easier. Secondly, treat everybody around you with a level of respect and kindness that you want from them. There's nothing more determined than a person who you pissed off. And, and, and trying to overcome the very people who are on your team because you have just embarrassed them or in some way uh, disparage them, just not a good thing as well. And then do the work. You know, uh, too many leaders want to get accolades, want to win all the awards, want to get a big bonus, but they are willing to put the work in. You know, put in the work and, and then the, the fruits can come from that. But some folks want to take that shortcut of if I'm just a disruptor, uh, or if I'm just honing in on the bottom line, or if I'm just the person who uh, can win the arguments, that's enough. Now, put in all the work. Put in the work, be, uh, be knowledgeable about your business, be knowledge knowledgeable about your employees, be knowledgeable about what's going on in the, uh, in the broader community. And then those fruits will come to you, earn them in other words. 
Hey man, we're simpatico. I'm over here taking notes myself, man. Those are all great principles of leadership. Um, are there any, when you think back, are there any books that you read that help sort of color those principles that you rely on or any books that stood out along the way that you would recommend to some other future leaders to take a look at as they embark on their leadership journey? Yeah, you know, I'm a big biography person. I, I love reading about other men and women and how they did it, you know, how, how uh, what motivated them, what were some of those, uh, like, as you call it, the North Star guiding pieces for them. Uh, and, you know, and, and a couple of stand out, and I'm a big novel person too, uh, you know, so in Obama's book, uh, The Audacity of Hope, you know, he really lays out there the pitfalls of being a leader, how lonely it can be when you're the guy making that final decision, you know, and especially once you become CEO of a big company, it's like, like when I was running Marta, so it's a billion dollar company uh, with a ton of things coming at you every single day. And, and Obama articulated this, that by the time a decision comes to you, a lot of smart people have been already thinking about it. You know, and a lot of them have been deliberating about it and they haven't been able to come to, the, haven't been able to make, a, make that decision. And so now it's on you. That can be, that can be awesome. It can be intimidating and so forth. But if you practice it enough, it can become routine. And that's the way I try to, uh, to, to, to live in that regard. So Obama, biography by people as, like Paul Robeson was an early hero of mine, the uh, singer, political activist, uh, and so forth. Reading how he navigated just the field of entertainment, the field of politics, international relations, how uh, this guy was able to do all those things but never lost the common touch. You know, never lost the fact that he could have a discussion with a Fortune 500 CEO, and then in the next uh, in, in the next few minutes, go in and have a, a, a truly heartfelt discussion with a migrant worker. That this guy, you know, was able to really talk with and, and, and understand lots of others. But also, don't don't shortchange novels. You know, Toni Morrison, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, of the novelist Toni Morrison, and from her I learned empathy. That she would take these characters who seem to have the worst traits possible, you know, the character from Beloved, Seth, cut her own child's head off, effectively. What she taught you was, to me, learn the whole person. So by the time you finish Beloved, you fully understand why she made that decision. You, may, you still may not agree with it, but learning empathy and being patient about understanding where the other person is coming from, that is the epitome of a good listener. Uh, and that, again, is one of those traits that I think every effective leader has, is that's a person who tries to understand where that other individual is coming from and meet them where they are so that then the two of you can then go other places, take your relationship to a different uh, plateau. So what, as you look back on your journey, what are two or three of the successes that you are most proud of? You know, the, the one here in Georgia, was the Clayton County expansion of Marta. Mm. That you know, there, there's glamorous things in the world of public transit. You know, you do get to hang out with, uh, like with the Russells, <laughs> you know, you, you hang out with all the politicians and these big developers of the Fortune 500 crowd, they get to know your first name. And they, they, so, so you do all those things. But there's a granular aspect to, to these jobs as well. And so in Clayton, when we went out there to try to expand the bus service, I literally was out there almost at least every other day for about six months, talking to people and so forth. And I'll never forget this lady comes up to me and she said, you know, I have been walking to all these public meetings at least two miles each time you have a public meeting because since they suspended the bus service out here several years ago, I've had no way of getting around. Mm -hmm. I'm having a very difficult time holding on to a job. Things are just really, really hard. So we need you to bring this service out to us. And we had a lot of opposition about making that happen. Um, and I remember the day that we, it came to a vote. But before, the, before the voters got a chance to vote, the commissioners had to vote on it. And I've never had a sense of nervousness like I had before that vote. Because that same lady who had been coming to all my public meetings comes over to me before that vote and whispers, I am praying for you. Mm. 
we are praying for you because if this thing doesn't happen, I don't know how much longer, you know, we'll be able to hold on. And thankfully, we were able to get the commissioners, uh, at least a majority of them, to support it. And then the bus service was installed. Those folks, it, the bus service wasn't a glamour thing. It wasn't a big economic development thing. It wasn't, it was, how do I get to a job? How do I get to a medical appointment? How do my kids get to school for their, uh, and, for, and how do they get to these after school appointments? So it was real. I mean, it was real. And so the fact that we we're able to, to overcome a bunch of obstacles and then see the, the vote go the way it did and then be out there in less than four months with the service running. And that same lady was one of our very first riders uh, on that service. So that was gratifying. So it felt just wonderful about making that happen, uh, being part of what, of what made that happen. You know, uh, the other more individual thing was getting that call from the White House from President Obama. Uh, saying that they wanted me to be a part of this National Infrastructure Advisory Council. And that's not something you advocate on your own. That's not something you fill out an application and say, hey, look, please um, pick me. That is purely people watching your work and saying, this is a person who we want as part of, of our team. So those two things stand out as a, a couple of things I feel pretty good about career-wise. What's one or two that you wish had gone differently? You know, the things that went poorly, in some respects, I'm still glad they happened because of, of what you learned from it. So in San Antonio, I'll tell you that what, what, what was fascinating or, or one of those things that went awry. We were trying to build rail in San Antonio for the first time. San Antonio is the largest city in the country did not have a rail, rail system of any type. So we thought we'd start off with a streetcar slash light rail type system. And it didn't go well initially. And the biggest thing that happened was we had created this task force and a couple of members of the task force took issue with a whole host of things and they went public with it. And, uh, and I remember reading front page of the San Antonio newspaper, top four, the mayor of San Antonio saying, the rollout of how the name of our transit system was to be in San Antonio, in San Antonio. The, the, the how they rolled out this streetcar uh, report has been amateurish. Mm. So the same mayor who is now a friend, Julian Castro, who became the first secretary of HUD, first Hispanic sec secretary of HUD under the Obama administration and ran for president. So he was one of the uh, early Democrats who uh, ran for what Biden ultimately won. But Front page in color, there's my name associated with an amateurish rollout of this big, big project. And, and it was, you know, it, it was uh, humbling. It was a whole host of things, but it got us to get back in, sort of like redouble the efforts, if you will, and turn it around within six months, fully funded project. So by the, and then I, and, and I left soon after that, but it was a fully funded, ready to go project when I left. So it felt good that you had that setback and then you're able to turn it back around. And there are many, many others. <laughs> that because you know, One of the reasons why I think I feel good in interviews with, uh, if I'm ever interviewing for a job, is that humility part. When people ask me this question, uh, what have you screwed up? I ask them how much time you have because there have been plenty of them. But I think it, again, humanizes you uh, and it gives you a level of comfort with them and them with you because they realize, hey man, this guy screws up just like I do. We all do it. And if you can accept it, learn from it, you know, move on. Uh, you know, one other one that was a, a nicely embarrassing one was in Charlotte, we were uh, trying to, back then I was a deputy city manager and was, we were trying to build a new uh, police precinct in this neighborhood. And so I'm dressed, but not like now, I actually having to tie the whole formal wear was going out into a relatively low wealth neighborhood. And they didn't trust me from the second I walked through the door. And so I was out there with a city council member. And so I thought the conversation went sort of okay, but was a little stiff. Afterwards, he told me, Keith, I'm just telling you, man, you bombed this one. You know, that they didn't, they, you, you didn't meet them where they are. So you just came across as a suit coming out, throwing all this data and facts and all these things. And they wanted to have a conversation, you know, so. I knew the next time I came out, 
there's going to be much more informal. It's going to be much more of a conversation versus, you know, the guy from City Hall giving them a big presentation. So yeah, yeah, being able to learn from it, move on, do the next big piece. Okay. Say you have an underperformer on your team, and you know that can be one of the most challenging components of leadership is dealing with sort of underperformers or having those difficult conversations. How do you deal with an underperformer on your team? And also, how do you have difficult conversations? Like say you have to uh, terminate someone's employment or you have to um, you know, shut down a division or how do you deal with those from, from a leader's perspective? Yeah, that, that's also, yeah. The, the things that leave you exhausted as a leader at the end of the day, are not generally the meat and potatoes of your operation. It's not making sure the buses run on time and making sure that, that um, we're meeting all of our customer service goals and that sort of thing. The things that exhaust you are when you have to deal with these personnel type issues. And you're dealing, with, so let's say if you're dealing with a person who's very good in a number of ways, but they're still not meeting the uh, performance objectives that you, that uh, you and she or you and he have agreed upon. And what I found over time is just being as direct as possible while being as compassionate as possible is the way to go. Um, that trying to gloss it over too much and not telling the person why, they're, why they aren't meeting their objectives doesn't help them. But in addition, coming in with a, you know, screaming, um, how dare you screw this up, I can't wait till you're gone type of mentality, that leaves you uh, feeling worse than that person quite, uh, quite frequently. So one of the things I've prided myself on in a career that boy, is now hit, hitting 30 years is never once have I publicly embarrassed any teammate. Never once have I cursed at any teammate. Never once have I tried to hurt the feelings of someone. And that can still happen, unfortunately. But the goal is keep that person's dignity every step of the way. So if they're underperforming, Talk to them about the underperformance. Don't try to go at them at, a, at, at, at uh, don't try to go at them as a person. Talk to them about what's not working and talk through how you try to make it work. And if it fundamentally isn't going to be a marriage that's going to be successful for the long term, you're not doing that person or yourself a favor by continuing to keep them there, uh, because an underperformer rarely just harms themselves. They are also harming their team and then the broader, in the broader work environment. And, and again, you're not doing them any long-term favor by keeping them there because they're obviously in the wrong role. But it is a tough thing. You know, uh, uh, my, one of my former bosses once told me, if you ever get to the point where you're comfortable with terminating somebody, then you need to start looking in the mirror about what type of leader you are. Mm. And, and that's the way I absolutely feel about it. I, you know, those are the nights I've had sleepless nights is when I've had to terminate someone because I know there's a, that's a man or woman whose family is depending on that role and know that there's a broader piece that's gonna be impacted by that person. And so yeah, that should hurt. You should anguish a bit before you have to make that ultimate decision. Okay. What's the, what's the headline if a college student came to you and asked you, how could they be a great leader? What, what, what would you give them? What, what, nugget of advice would you give them? And then the same question for someone that's more like a 30 year old, that's a young professional that has had a job or two and they're still trying to refine their ability to be to lead, be a leader. So what would you tell a college student? And then what would you tell like a young professional about leadership? Wouldn't change. Okay. It would be the same for the college student and the, and the more experienced person. And these are the lessons I learned from my father. My dad died at age 59 in uh, 2007, but was the most fundamentally impactful person in my life, and still is, you know, still you know, go back to his wisdom all the time, but working hard. We talked about that one uh, a, little, a little bit ago. So don't let the other folks outwork you, you know, do, do that part. Second, carry yourself with dignity that you never know who's watching and that person who's watching might be the one who has the next key to, your, to the door that you want open. Third, uh, be humble. You know, we talked about that a little bit. Be that humble person who's able to listen and learn from others and not fall to the trappings that a lot of young executives, a lot of young leaders fall to. Be nice, 
just being a kind person can bring a lot more folks in your fold and helping to uh, uh, and helping you reach all these goals and, and uh, aspirations you might have. And then the last one, people forget about this all the time, be respectful of women. And I don't mean that just for men, I mean other women, that if, if, if you are a person who can work with both genders, that means you dramatically increase the, the, the support system as well as the folks who you can support uh, within your organizations. I have found people who struggle to work with women, both men and women, uh, to be the ones who don't move up very far in their organization. So those are the five biggest things. And add to that, be passionate about what you do. So if you don't have passion about it, you might be doing the wrong thing and, and look for that piece that, that brings you that passion uh, so that, again, you become that leader you ultimately want to be by being more well-rounded and really caring about what it is you're doing. So I have two last questions. One is being in the CEO role since around the age of 30, how do you balance the demands of the CEO role with your family life? Because I know your family, man, you got yeah. your wife, you got your kid. Like, how do you balance that? Much better now than when I was 30. That when I was a 30 year old, I thought the key to the kingdom was just outworking everybody and working all the time and never, uh, and never taking a break. Uh, and now I recognize life's too short and you, you want to enjoy the fruits that you are producing with the folks who are around you. So we, we take family vacations, we spend time, we, you know, with this COVID thing, we probably spend more time together uh, than, than, than in recent memory. So, and then being respectful of your family and their time, that's a big, big deal. You know, um, I'm gonna send you a video of my son. Uh, he just did this uh, thing with, with uh, my wife and one of our daughters, this, this COVID song. And so I was, a, and I also like the director. And so we put this little production together. So I send it to you, it's hilarious. <laughs> so, so doing those type things are a lot of fun and you got to be able to do that. Got to be able to do that. So just balance. Okay. And then in closing, what would you like your legacy to be as a leader? Um, you, you've worked in transportation, you've worked in now nonprofit reach. What would you like your legacy to be when people think back on you and the impact you had on them? What would you like that legacy to be? Still a work in progress, but man, I mean, being able, if, if we're able to fundamentally help move Atlanta from being, unfortunately, uh, uh, we have been recognized as the worst city in the country to be born poor if you're trying to move up. The, in, the lack of income mobility and, uh, and economic mobility. If we, if, if we can make a difference in helping Atlanta reach much higher heights and helping the least of these in our communities reach higher heights, if on my, uh, if, if, if on my gravesite, it reads that Keith helped move the needle in helping more people reach their economic dreams, then that it's been a life well lived. So I, I feel good about that. Terrific. So we have, we have one question from one of our members and his question is what age does the training begin through the career connector? And at what point would this training be beneficial for young people that aren't interested in college? Oh, immediately. In fact, you, you know Andre Dickens and Andre, uh, the, the council member, he and I, along with some others, we created this program um, at Goodwill, specifically geared towards folks who don't go to college, but who want to pick up technical skills in IT. So they come out of the program debt-free with a number of different certifications and, uh, and, and now ready to be employed We've gotten them employed with places like Honeywell and Home Depot and a whole host of other uh, spots, making a heck of a lot more than entry-level uh, wages typically. So yes, so as soon as you're ready to come to work, we're ready to, uh, to work with you. And how could the people that tune into this be beneficial or help you um, as the CEO of Goodwill? Like what can we do to support you? Yes, so if you um, have jobs that uh, you want to get keep people connected to, contact us again at Goodwill NG for Goodwill North Georgia, uh, dot org, uh, can call me directly because we're always looking for great next jobs for our participants. 
So that's one way. Continue to donate to Goodwill, whether it's monetarily or uh, through uh, cash donate, I mean, uh, not monetarily or through donations at our stores and, and that sort of thing. And then finally, you know, whenever people, uh, now that you've sort of had a crash course, 101 course about uh, what Goodwill is and your cocktail hour conversations, that sort of thing, tell them what uh, good work we're doing over here. You know, we feel proud of the things that we're, we're able to do and the people we're able to help, but we need to do more of uh, broadcasting that. We need to let more people know about it so we can help even more folks. Okay. Well, this has been great as always. I've enjoyed talking to you. And as always, I think our young people, our students and scholars will benefit from this discussion. So we thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing you soon and hanging out when we can. Absolutely, my brother. And to all the 100, uh, blessings to you, blessings to your family. And hey, sky's the limit. So reach the sky. And uh, thank you for your great work. You are definitely making a difference and moving the needle in the community. So thanks to you and the whole team over at Goodwill North Georgia. All right, we appreciate it. Happy New Year. All right, have a good one.